The event loop is a pretty notorious topic in JavaScript, but when we zoom out, it's just a tiny component within the JavaScript runtime. We also have the call stack, we have web APIs, we have the task queue, micro task queue, and then eventually the event loop. Well, to be a little more technically accurate here, we actually have the JavaScript engine in which we have the call stack and then also the memory heap, but to keep my slides a little organized, I'll just be showing the call stack here. All these components together allow us to use asynchronous tasks in a non-blocking way in JavaScript. And this is important because JavaScript itself is single threaded. We're only working with a single call stack. So the call stack manages the execution of our program. So if we have the following script, we first have console log one. So a new execution context is created, pushed onto the call stack, which is then evaluated and logs one. Then we have console log two, same story. Execution context is created, pushed onto the call stack, is evaluated and logs two. Then on line 14, we invoke another function, the log three and four. And within this function body, we invoke yet another function, log three. And within log three, we invoke another function, log the console log three. Eventually it logs three. Then on the second line within the log three and four function body, we console log four four gets logged, and now the log three and four execution context is popped off the call stack as well. Now, something important to remember here again is that JavaScript can handle a single task at a time. So if we, for example, have this long running task in which we have a pretty heavy computation, it takes a while before JavaScript can continue with the rest of our program. So the console log long task done is only logged after a couple seconds. And this is not what we want, because in the meantime, our entire program is frozen. So we want to avoid these long running tasks. But in a real life application, we often have to use these long running tasks, like maybe a network request or anything based on user input, timers. So what happens then? Like, is our entire call stack just blocked until we get the data back? No because we're actually using web APIs in those cases. And web APIs provide a set of interfaces that allow us to interact with the browser's features. This includes functionality that we often use, like the document object model, fetch, set timeout, and so many more. The browser is a very powerful platform with a lot of features. Some of these features are required, like the rendering engine or the networking stack. But we also have access to some cooler ones, like device ones, uh, sensors, cameras, geolocation, and so on. Okay, cool, but what does this have to do with long running tasks? Well, some of these web APIs allow us to offload long running tasks to the browser. So when we invoke such an API, we're kind of just initiating that offloading. And web APIs that expose these asynchronous capabilities are either callback based or promise based. So first let's focus on the callback based APIs and I'm just gonna use the geolocation API because it's fun. I could have used any other callback based API, but let's say that we wanna get the user's location. And for this, we can use the get current position method exposed by the geolocation API. And this receives two callbacks. First, we have the success callback in case everything goes well and the user allows us to get the location and we actually get it from the browser or the error callback in case anything goes wrong. So let's see what happens when we actually use this in our script. So first the get current position invocation gets added to the call stack. However, this is just to register those callbacks and initiate that async task. After doing that, it can get popped off the call stack immediately. So it doesn't wait for any data. Now in the background, the browser starts some kind of process that eventually shows the user pop-up. Now, of course, we don't know when the user is gonna interact with this pop-up, but that's not a problem because this is not happening on the call stack. So our entire website is still responsive in case other tasks need to run instead. Now, finally, the user clicks on allow. So the API receives the data from the browser and uses the success callback to handle this result. However, it can't just push that callback back onto the call stack. This could disrupt an already running task and just create very unpredictable behavior. So instead, the callback gets pushed to the task queue, which is also called the callback queue for this exact reason. The task queue holds web API callbacks and event handlers to be able to get executed at some point later in the future. And this is where we finally get to the event loop. It's the event loop's responsibility to check if the call stack is empty. And if that's the case, so if nothing is running, it then gets the first available task from the task queue and moves this to the call stack where it's executed. So now finally, we handle the results and the user's location is logged to the console. Another very popular callback based web API is set timeout. And set timeout also receives a callback and a delay. So let's see how that works. So first we encounter a set timeout. 
and this again gets added to the call stack, but all it does again is register that callback and also the delay with the timers API. And in the background, the browser will actually handle that timer. Then we have another set timeout and again, it registers the callback and the delay. Now our timers are still running and we have a console log end of script. This just gets added to the call stack and logs end of script, nothing asynchronous here. Now after 100 milliseconds, the browser was like, hey, 100 milliseconds expired. So now the callback moves onto the task queue. There's nothing on the call stack right now. So this moves onto the call stack where eventually it logs 100 milliseconds. Now 2000 milliseconds are up. Again, same story. The callback is pushed onto the task queue. Call stack is empty. So it moves onto the call stack where it logs 2000 milliseconds. So it's just very important to remember that when you have a set timeout and a delay, it's not the delay until it gets moved onto the call stack. No, it's the delay until it gets moved to the task queue. So this means that the delay that we specify might not actually be the delay to execution. Because if the call stack was still very full with other tasks and this could run for many more seconds, the callback would still have to wait in the task queue until the call stack is empty. So just something to, to keep in mind. So long story short, the callbacks provided by web APIs are pushed onto the task queue when the asynchronous task completes. So what about the promise-based ones? If you haven't checked out my promises video yet, I highly recommend you watch it because I'll just assume some basic promise knowledge uh, while explaining this entire flow. Whenever we work with promises, we're working with the micro task queue. The micro task queue is a special queue dedicated to then catch finally callbacks, uh, a function body execution after await, the queue micro task callback and the new mutation observer callback. So only those callbacks or those function body parts get pushed onto the micro task queue. So it's very specific. However, the event loop prioritizes the micro task queue. So whenever the call stack is empty, the event loop first ensures that the micro task queue is entirely empty. So it gets all the tasks from the micro task queue, moves them onto the call stack where they get executed and only then will it move to the task queue. And after each task in the task queue, it again checks the micro task queue and a popular promise-based web API is fetch. So let's see what happens behind the scenes when we invoke fetch. So whenever we call fetch, it's added to the call stack. This is just responsible for creating a promise object, which by default is pending. The result is undefined and we don't have any promise reactions just yet. It also initiates that background network request that's handled by the browser. Then we move on to the next line, we have the den handler. And this creates a promise reaction record where we have res console log res. The server still hasn't responded by the way, but we get to line four. So there we have a synchronous console log end of script. So now end of script is logged to the console. And then finally, the server returns some data. So now the promise data is set to fulfilled. The promise result is now the response object with the data that we got from the server. And the promise reaction handler is now also pushed to the micro task queue, right? Cause it's a then callback and that gets pushed to the micro task queue. The call stack is empty. So the event loop checks the micro task queue moves this to the call stack where it eventually logs the result that we got from the server. Something to keep in mind with micro tasks is that a micro task can also schedule another micro task. And this means that the event loop is just constantly handling the micro task and it can never actually get to the task queue. It would just have to wait indefinitely. So we're kind of creating an infinite loop, an infinite micro task loop, um, freezing our entire program. I believe in Node, you can set like max tick depth or something like that, which prevents this exact thing from happening. But just make sure that you don't accidentally end up doing that. And we can also promiseify uh, a callback based API. So for example, we can rep the get current position with a new promise constructor. And for the success callback and the error callback, we just pass resolve and reject. So this can be a pretty nice solution just to improve the readability within your code base a bit. All right. A little quiz to see if you uh, kind of understand it. So we have a promise resolve with a den handler. We have a set timeout. We have a queue micro task in which we have another queue micro task. And then we have a console log five. It's up to you to see what gets logged. So pause the video now and let's see if you got it right. And the right answer is five, one, three, four, two. So let's see why. First, we have the promise resolve, and this just creates a new promise object that's instantly resolved. Then on the next line, we have the den handler. The promise is already resolved. So in the background, it does create that promise reaction, but the handler is immediately pushed to the micro task queue. Then we have set timeout, which is responsible for initiating that timer. 
So the callback and the delay get passed to the API and in the background, the browser starts some sort of timer. Then we have queue microtask. So the call is added to the call stack and this queues that callback to the microtask queue. Then we have the synchronous console log five. So this gets pushed to the call stack and logs five. And in the meantime, the 10 milliseconds are up. So the callback from set timeout is pushed to the task queue because this was a callback based API. So task queue. Our script is done. The call stack is empty. So the event loop checks the micro task queue. And there we have the promise handler callback. And this eventually calls console log one. So one is logged to the console. Then we have the queue micro task callback. And within this callback, we call console log three. So three is logged to the console. Then we call another queue micro task. And this queues another micro task with, it, with its callback to the micro task queue. However, the event loop has to ensure that the micro task queue is entirely empty before moving on to the task queue. So that callback is immediately moved onto the call stack again and logs four. Now, finally, the call stack is empty and the micro task queue is empty. So the first available task from the task queue is moved onto the call stack and this eventually logs two. So now we have five, one, three, four, two. So let's just recap what we've covered so far. So JavaScript is single threaded. It can only handle one task at a time. We can use web APIs to interact with the features leveraged by the browser. And some of these APIs allow us to initiate async tasks in the background. So the function call that initiates an async task like that is still added to the call stack, but this is just to hand it off to the browser. The actual async task is handled in the background, so it does not block the call stack. The task queue is used by callback based web APIs to enqueue the callback once the asynchronous task has completed. Then we have the micro task queue, which is only used by promise handlers, the async function bodies after await, the queue micro task queue callbacks and the new mutation observer callbacks. This queue has priority over the task queue and the event loop ensures that this queue is entirely empty before moving on to the task queue. And after handling each task from the task queue, the event loop again checks the micro task queue to ensure that nothing has been added in the meantime. You often come across asynchronous JavaScript and if you aren't entirely sure why things execute a certain way, it might just be very discouraging. But I hope that my explanation for the task queue and the micro task queue and the event loop kind of helped you understand why certain parts of our code execute at a certain time. Of course, as always, if you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out. But I also highly recommend that you kind of just play around with it yourself. Like try using set timeout, try using queue micro task, just to get a better sense of like, oh yeah, okay, I understand why this runs at this time and why this doesn't execute, stuff like that. Good luck and have fun coding.